Hey everyone, this is Susan and Scott Westwater from Pragmatic Digital. We're so excited to be here at UX Copenhagen and sharing our talk, creating useful and usable voice experiences. We've been working with voice for the past three or so years, and we want to share a lot of the experience that we have um, with you so you can actually figure out where you fit and how user experience fits within the world of voice. So in the beginning, there was desktop. And so when I started my career, that's really the world of the web um, back at the end of the 90s. So we were designing for a fixed size screen. A little bit later, we had uh, portables really take off and we started looking at how do we design um, websites that actually work on both sides. And then mobile happened. And that's really where the idea of responsive design and progressive enhancement took off because we wanted to create a really good optimized experience for that smaller screen instead of going through and pinching and zooming to try to actually see actual web content on your mobile device. So it's changed a lot in the past 30 years, but I want you to think for a moment, what happens if we take all visuals away? How does someone get from point A to point B? What if there's no screen that you're actually designing for? How do you clearly communicate what you're trying to either, you know, information wise to commit to the person or how do you get them to interact with that experience? This is the reality um, for a lot of voice experiences. And so I want you to think about that as we, as we talk through this presentation, because it's a really hard proposition, but don't worry, you got all the skills to make it happen. So once upon a time, things used to be siloed. Like customers would think about that as a web experience. Brick and mortar was another. Um, customer service was a call center and it was separate. There wasn't an expectation that it was all cohesive, but instead they did kind of think of things separately and it was okay. But then things came together and those divisions have begun to fade, especially with the dawn of different devices that make mobility and multitasking what they are. Those experiences then began to get viewed as holistic and there was an expectation that those brands that were in each of those channels were being consistent that it was one connected value proposition and that whatever that brand was in say web world needed to be the same as what i heard about in store and it made it really important that we think about things not just from a device perspective but from a holistic perspective now this is old hat for a lot of user experience professionals because we make that work to our advantage. And we've been doing that for a while. And then came along this thing called voice where sometimes there's a screen, sometimes they're not. Um, you know, It was an imperfect technology when it initially came out, there were some false starts, but we've really come into our own over the past year and a half or so from a technology standpoint. And so now it's time to start applying a lot of the design thinking and user experience knowledge that we have to these voice experiences. So before we get too far into the presentation, uh, we wanted to just cover off on what is voice. And so the way we like to think of it, it's an umbrella term that is really any interaction that allows a person to control a computer simply by speaking. And so it could be your Amazon Alexa and your Google Home hockey puck devices, um, which don't have screens, but it also it could be your mobile, your smartphone device. So you could have, if you're on an Android device, Google Assistant, or if you're on an Apple device, you have Siri. And so these are all different examples of voice interaction. And like I said a little bit ago, sometimes there's a screen, but a lot of times there isn't. And we need to figure out how we can actually design for both of those scenarios. But in addition to all of these devices that you know, we may or may not have, there's no shortage of devices that are actually shipping with, you know, either a home built personal assistant in it, say from BMW or Mercedes, or Alexa being built into some high end sports cars, um, all the way through, you know, washers and dryers and kitchen timers and thermometers and, and, and you name it, there's all these different devices that have a component of voice in it. And so, Sometimes it's just literally talking and hearing a response back. Sometimes it's talking and actually getting the response on the screen. Those are all considered voice experiences. Yep. So what makes voice compelling? Why is it we are starting to see um, there's 90 million 
uh, of those Alexa speakers that are in the U.S. right now in homes. Um, it's on all of these millions of phones. And then as Scott was just talking through, it's in all of these devices. Well, it's because it's inclusive and it's adaptable. Um, you can do hands-free, uh, eyes-free experiences. So you can multitask. So if you're driving, it makes a lot of sense to use your voice and not have to click or tap or swipe. It's also easy to use for many people. There isn't a literacy requirement. Um, children can use it because you don't have to be able to read. You can just speak. For the first time in a very long time, technology is learning how we communicate as opposed to us learning how to use that technology. Um, the other part of it too is that it has multilingual support then as well as so in addition to being something where it's helping those who might have visual impairments or those who have problems with using their dexterity and small motor movements, big fine motor movements due to um, joint diseases or things like that, we're also able to reach a whole population that just has had a barrier of language because in the voice context, we are able to use artificial intelligence to be able to do translations. So what used to only be one page of web copy opens up to a whole new multitude of opportunities of where it is a matter of being able to use translation so that you can speak to someone in their primary language instead of uh, forcing an English experience. The other great thing is we're seeing a pretty diverse age range of folks yes. using these devices. So it's not just relegated to your typical 18 and 34 year olds, you know, tech savvy folks. Folks that are 50 and over, maybe not as tech savvy, are finding a lot of comfort in using these devices because all they have to do is talk and it actually responds to what they ask. So overall, you're seeing this technology being adopted incredibly quickly and it's because of a lot of the reasons um, that are listed here on the slide. So let's talk about conversational AI um, or artificial intelligence. Right now we're living in a, in a, in a stage where it's probably a little more artificial than it is intelligent, mm -hmm. but every, it is making strides by leaps and bounds every month. Um, and so the aspects of AI that are involved is language and speech and then the visual predictive. And this set of technologies is what enables computers to understand, process, um, and respond to voice or text. It's a lot of structures. There's some learning and understanding how phonetically um, things, you know, you pronounce things. So there's linguistics involved. But the important thing to know is that a lot of this is handled by engineers and folks who are specialists in that. And that's an area where we can talk to them and work with them. You have a partner. Um, you don't just have to know all everything is um, about artificial intelligence and be able to develop it all. There are partners who can help you along the way. And as a matter of fact, a good team will have that. Yeah. So when we look at the AI continuum, you know, from the robot from Lost in Space to Jarvis from Iron Man, we're actually way closer to Danger Will Robinson on the left there than we are to Jarvis. So there's this natural inclination that most people think, you know, we're having deep, rich conversations with computers and they're able to respond to absolutely everything. And it's because of what you see in TV and movies. Um, but the reality is there's still a lot of manual programming that happens, a lot of if then statements. If someone says this, then, you know, have this happen. Um, so we're still closer to that first area. But like Sue said, it's, it's growing exponentially and the technology is progressing very fast. And so we've gone beyond the time where simply we're asking, can we get it to work? Now it's, can we get it to work well? Can we start to have some deeper conversations? Can the machine understand you know, multiple dialects, multiple mm -hmm. languages um, from a single experience and things like that? So we're now at a point where we really need a lot of the folks that are attending this conference to get involved because you have the experience, you know, you've gone through these evolutions in technology and we really need your brains. So voice is a new way to connect. It facilitates a one-to-one -one connection without the resource load that comes with having an army of actual individuals. Um, the interactions are initiated by the user. Mm -hmm. So engagement is actually welcomed and invited. But that has a whole host of challenges that come with it that we're used to thinking through. The idea of if they don't ask for it, they won't know. So how do we guide through that? It also adds this dimension to text in the sense that you can evoke emotion through sound. And that's not just through the words, but it's also through the sounds um, of music or even using um, any type of thinking through HCI of understanding sounds that are triggers 
or alarms or things along those lines. All of those work together as almost like this perfect symphony that makes a much more robust experience. Little Q&A session right after this. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask away during that session. Or as Susan said, our contact information is there and feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much for watching.